It's Friday, February 17. In the headlines, Boat's lawyers file a motion in court to recover funds from SSL. In business news, JUTC projects over a billion dollar net deficit. Regionally, France aims to develop greater ties with Guyana. Internationally, Chad buckling under pressure from hundreds of thousands of refugees. And in sports, a former Jamaican WNBA player dies. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. It's being reported that Usain Bolt's lawyers have filed two claims in the Supreme Court on behalf of Wellgen Limited, the company associated with Sprint Legend. Usain Bolt. The claims are in relation to the fraud uncovered at investment firm Stocks and Securities Limited. Bolt reported that he was fleeced of more than 12 million US dollars in the scam. Following the expiration of a 10-day ultimatum for the return of his client's funds in January, Bolt's attorney, Linton Gordon, told the media that he met with temporary manager of Stocks and Securities Limited, Kenneth Tomlinson. At the time, Mr. Gordon acknowledged that the world record holder may have to file a lawsuit in a bid to recover the missing funds. Bolt is one of at least 40 SSL clients whose investments were totally or almost wiped out in the fraud, estimated to be about $3 billion so far. Local entrepreneurs and members of the public are invited to participate in the Dominican Week in Jamaica. It's the brainchild of the Embassy of the Dominican Republic, the first in the history of our bilateral relations. The week-long activities begin today, February 17, and is set to end on February 24. We sat down with Dominican Republic Ambassador to Jamaica, Angie Martinez, to get the details. The Dominican Republic has indicated its intent to expand its bilateral relations with Jamaica. It's with this aim in mind that Dominican Week in Jamaica was conceptualized. It will be an opportunity to promote more investments on both sides of the countries, uh, or more uh, to promote more business, more investment between our two countries, more tourism, and of course our cultural values. Dominican Week in Jamaica will also see a business forum being held with round table discussions in which topics of interest for both countries will be addressed, such as industry, commerce, investment, tourism, aviation, ports, customs, agriculture, free zones, call center, orange economy, near shore and logistics hub, environment and others. So attention, Jamaican companies that want to promote their products in the Dominican market or, that, or they want to do some synergies with Dominican companies, please join us. Be part of the first ever Jamaican Dominican Republic Business Forum. You can write us on this email and be part of that. And also all the Jamaican people that want to enjoy the Dominican culture, they can be part of our all the activities that we have for you. For example, today we'll be at the Jamaican uh, food and drink to have a Dominican night with Dominican rum, Dominican food, Dominican music. We will have on Sunday at the Sovereign uh, Theater Center, we will have a movie of the Dominican Republic that you can enjoy with us. And uh, we have a, a chef from Dominican Republic also during this week. And we will close with this big, big party at Holy Smoke. So I wait all of you on Friday 24 to learn how to dance merengue and bachata with us. And stay tuned in our Instagram and looking forward to see you there. This historic event is being organized in collaboration with the relevant stakeholders in Jamaica, as well as entities from the Dominican Republic. The government has provided $868.4 million towards the Jamaica Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project to enhance the country's resilience to disasters and climate risk. The money has been provided in the 2023-2024 Estimates of Expenditure, now before the House of Representatives. According to a report by the JIS, these are planned for the upcoming fiscal year. Maya Chung tells us more. 
For the upcoming fiscal year, the project seeks to commence coastal protection works in Anato Bay, St. Mary, continue works on and around the Big Pond, Maiton Gully Drain, and facilitate training on the new building codes by institutions such as Hart NSTA Trust, Management Institute for National Development Mind, and the University of Technology, UTEC, Jamaica. The project also seeks to complete a three-year research fellowship seismology and complete the National Risk Information Platform, NRIP, microzonation study and coastal assessments. Achievements up to December 2022 included infrastructure works and equipping of the seismic support unit at the University of the West Indies completed, civil works on two box culverts, church pen 1 and 2 completed, and two water trucks procured and delivered to the Jamaica Fire Brigade. Other achievements included construction of the Montego Bay Fire Station, Yalas Fire Station, and Port Maria Fire Station. Port Royal Street Coastal Protection Works completed and Ecosystems Assessments Report and drafts of the revised Jamaica Fire Code JFC and the Jamaica Building Code JBC completed. The project is being implemented by the Jamaica Social Investment Fund, JSIF, with funding from the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, IBRD, and the government of Jamaica. For the news on PBCJ, I am Maya Chung. Itinia Nathaniel Henry is a community advocate in Jonestown, Kingston. He believes that service above self is a worthy lifetime achievement. His work in his neighborhood is proof of this belief, and that's why he is a community hero. He grew up in Hannatown but moved to Jonestown in 1988. He describes those years as challenging with violent and continuous gang wars. You would have seen a lot of murder, a lot of um, shootings, a lot of friends were lost. And it was just tense and even peace treated. The craziest thing was we used to have peace treated dance and that's when the, the peace used to broke. He says his father was there on important occasions, but his mother was a constant supporter to him and his siblings. To Itinia, education was the only way out. It was um, basic school, which was um, Edith, um, Edith Dalton Middle School. And then I went to Shetola Park Primary. I got a scholarship to go to Lallemans Prep. This is the only one. And then against all the odds, with the violence, everything that was going on, I chose education, focus on education. I was able to get a scholarship and I went to Camp, the Campion College, best school ever. And that's where I went, met my best friends, you know, Mr. Spencer, Shanda Bruce, and it changed my life. Then I got a youth scholarship again to go to university in Cuba. This is probably why I talk so fast, because Spanish saved me. And then I came back, you know, joined the corporate world. The goal of using education to secure his future was attained. So why venture into volunteerism? I started out with the CDC under Luke George Cook. In, in 2011, and I even was doing back in 2010 at youth clubs when I was gained for employer at Jerry Neville. I was um, assistant supervisor there. And when I left Neville, I was there not doing anything. And so, what we want to tell young people is that if you're there not doing anything, you could also volunteer your time, you know, and then based on that, it opened doors for you to get access to, to work because some of these persons who are helping with charity work are actually persons from the business sector. And they see that you're committed to the cause, that there's no money involved, you're willing to work, you will open doors. I started an avenue where I could get work by being around business people, so I started it. And I actually started to enjoy it because the joy on people's face when you help them, you know, it's a selfish reason, but it makes me feel good inside. Mr. Henry has been a part of several community development initiatives over the years, but some have been more memorable than others. So we're doing a, a project now called Increase the Peace, USA Fund it, so this is a shirt. And in, in the project, we're basically trying to get behavior changes from at-risk youth between the age of 10 up to 29. And so we look at a 10-year-old girl, and so you look at it, it's about four months, so we're going to track their behavior changes. So this is a girl coming to us. And it started out, we having a computer marathon with the Lesma Ellis Foundation. That was on January the 7th. And when we have the function, we're giving out biscuits, sweets, whatever it is. And this girl joined the line. And when the shopkeeper called me, and the shopkeeper was telling me what happened, 
And I saw it. The little girl was able to reach online like 10, 12 times, you know, get a case of stuff, you know. I had the idea to sell it back to the shopkeeper for profit, you know. I kept on going back in. It's like, sir, we don't get none. And that's dishonest. That's wrong with everything. And, it's, and give credit to the shopkeeper who kind of refused to buy it for her because she know it was ill-got gains. But then the genius of, of what she was doing to kind of hustle mentality. And it's like, you're 10 years old. You're on the wrong path of thinking. But there's something there that you want to earn money and thing. And so that's how we started negative. So now we end up going to um, downtown to National Art Gallery, which was two weeks ago, recently. And we're going to National Art Gallery. I was the person who was driving. I carried her and she was in the car. And we stopped at a stoplight and there was a lady, old lady, begging money. I was like, don't have any money on me or anything. And I was going to drive off. And she said, no, sir, stop. The same little 10-year-old girl. And she was like, she can't get a hundred dollars here. I have hundred dollars for me lunch money, but she can't get it. Everybody was blowing the horn because it's green light. And I said, yo, we're breaking the law. She said, sir, yes, but it's for the right reason. And that's the transition. So she moved from doing the wrong thing for the wrong reason. And now she's doing the wrong thing again, so it's still a progress, but she's doing it for the right reason. So make them wait, sir, for the right reason I do it for. And I was so proud of her. Well, Mr. Aitana Henry, as we call him, the boss. <laughs> Very, very hardworking, industrious. He's one of the persons that put in the extra effort and the mile to get all the... See that we are in a volatile area. He always tries to get projects and programs to, to get the youths together. If it's even once or twice per week, because, you know, they idle, so they will find things that won't be beneficial to anybody. So he has programs, he has a computer program and uh, once a week we have classes on Saturdays. Two, two, two sessions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So, and Mr. Henry is the, I don't know him do it, but he's always the first person here and always the last person to leave. And he goes the extra mile just to get everything going. It's the best thing ever that the community is buying in. We're very segregated, different from the side you come from, even though everybody should be under one banner. But for different reasons, the social, there are all different implications where um, even gang warfare, everybody have a side. But everybody has united around me and around the project. So I can't, I would never complain about the support that we've gotten. Several times when he was getting funding from the USAID program, he was back and front with us. Dedication, fervor and zealousness just to get the project approved in order to have this program run in his community. So his dedication should be commended because he goes above and beyond. Time now for the business report with Danita Rodney. The Jamaica Urban Transit Company, JUTC, says it is projecting a net deficit of $7 billion in the new fiscal year, even as it plans to roll out more buses and increase the number of passengers carried. The company plans to increase its fleet of buses by 50 in the new fiscal year, which should help it to boost passenger numbers to 72%. However, with staff costs, fuel and lubricants, and repairs and maintenance accounting for 80% of the spending, the JUTC is expecting over $14 billion in expenses and over $2 billion in revenues, leaving the company at a $7 billion deficit after a government grant. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Thursday, February 16, the US dollar sold for an average of $155.15. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $117.02. The pound sterling traded for $188.59. And the euro sold for an average of $166.10. In GSE trading, the GSE index advanced by 1,644 points. The junior market index declined by 12 points. The combined market index advanced by 1,417 points and the All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 2,499 points. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 109 stocks of which 42 advanced, 52 declined and 15 traded firm. Stocks advanced for AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, 
Blue Power Group Limited and CAC 2000 Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited Variable Preference, and Barita Investments Limited. Trading firm were Cargo Handlers Limited, Epley 7.50% preference shares due 2024, and Epley Limited 5% preference shares. The overall volume leaders were Image Plus Consultants Limited, Derrimon Trading Company Limited, and Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares, all with over 1 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, Calypso Macro Index 1 was the only active security posting 41 shares. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Goddard Enterprises Limited was the sole security trading over 12,000 shares. In regional business, Tackling food security and sustainability has been the focus of the 44th regular meeting of Heads of Government of CARICOM. Megan Shepard has the details. The region looking to fight food insecurity one farm at a time. This from the Acting Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, Mario Labutkin. He says he believes that one of the challenges is countries are only finding partial solutions to the food challenges of facing the region. I think that each one of us, each one of the countries, because we support the countries, are finding partial solution. The point is how we can mm -hmm. combine and I think that is part of the discussion that are happening exactly in this moment between the president and the prime minister. Minister of Agriculture and Marine Resources Clay Sweeting, adding they've also discussed how the FAO can assist in developing the national food and agriculture policy. We've already started to develop um, some aspects of that and how we can further develop in regards to legislation, uh, regulations, uh, foreign policy as well as domestic investment in agri-food systems. The minister says the goal is to reduce the country's dependence on food imports. Uh, modernizing the agri-food systems involving Bahamians and ensuring that we help to reduce our imports uh, by hopefully 25% by 2025 with our commitment to CARICOM. In international business, Mercedes-Benz Group is warning lower earnings for 2023 amid economic uncertainty. More from this Reuters report. Mercedes-Benz beat forecasts on Friday with annual earnings of $21.8 billion. The German carmaker boosted margins by focusing on top-end sales, which saw strong growth last year. Fourth quarter earnings were also above analyst projections at $5.7 billion. Mercedes-Benz stayed cautious on the future though. The premium automaker warned of lower earnings this year due to economic uncertainty. It sees group earnings slightly below last year. The carmaker's warning for the year ahead is similar to the message being repeated across the auto industry. Rival Volkswagen has made a similar forecast. It saw a weak economy going forward and an ongoing shortage of key components. Germany's Autos Association has predicted car sales would hit around 74 million vehicles worldwide this year. That's up 4% from last year, but still 8% below pre-health crisis levels. Shares in Mercedes-Benz were up over 3% on Friday. In market data for oil, oil prices fell slightly and were set to close the week lower as concerns over rising US interest rates and a strong dollar largely offset optimism over a potential recovery in Chinese demand. Brent oil futures fell one cent to $84.55 a barrel, while West Texas intermediate crude futures fell seven cents to $77.97. And that was the business report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. In regional news, CARICOM leaders are discussing pressing issues at the 44th regular meeting of the Heads of Government of CARICOM. CBC News' Wendy Burke gives us a highlight of pressing issues facing the region. Members of the 15-member bloc assembled for two days of robust discussion at the 44th regular meeting of Heads of Government, where the Prime Minister of the Bahamas, Philip Davis, assumed chairmanship of CARICOM for the next six months. In welcoming the delegates, Dr. Carla Barnett, Secretary General of CARICOM, said there are pressing issues to be dealt with ahead of the 50th anniversary. This is the year when we commemorate the vision created, the courage had, and the legacy left by those who went before us. It is the year when we renew our commitment to the community 
and enrich this unique legacy for those who will follow us. This meeting provides us with an opportunity to make long-lasting decisions for our peoples for the next 50 years and beyond. Prime Minister of St. Kitts, Dr. Terence Drew, who is attending his first heads of government in that position, says the region is at a crossroads and must deal with the challenges impacting small island states. We must focus our attention on the myriad of challenges confronting us as small island developing states and low-lying coastal communities in an ever-increasing hostile global environment. Our challenges are well known to us. And I point out a few. Vulnerability to the external economic shocks, heavy dependence on a few, few products or services, frequent and more intense natural disasters, high cost associated with debt and climate change adaptation and mitigation. He also spoke about the difficulties associated with infra-regional travel. Prime Minister Philip Davis wants CARICOM member states to strengthen their collective response in a number of areas with a resolution for Haiti being among them. As a near neighbor, the Bahamas is under great strain and many other countries in our region are already heavily impacted. We will all benefit if Haiti is again fully functioning as a state. We should learn from the failures of past efforts to help, rather than use these disappointments as an excuse for inaction. I pray that we can agree a series of concrete steps to help move towards a solution for the Haitian people and the region as a whole. We have learnt that inaction has its own costs and consequences. The meeting is also being attended by international heads of government and organizations, and the delegates were treated to song and dance before their discussions got underway. Wendy Burke, CBC News. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is pledging 10 million US dollars to the International Office of Migration during the 44th regular meeting of heads of government of CARICOM on Thursday. It is expected to strengthen the protection of Haitian women and children, among other things that will assist the struggling Caribbean nation. We've provided direct support to bolster the Haitian National Police so that Haiti has the tools and support to solve this situation, including by deploying surveillance aircraft and vital strategic security equipment and vehicles, and additional delivery of MRAP vehicles in the coming days. And today, I am announcing that Canada will also deploy Royal Canadian Navy vessels to conduct surveillance, gather intelligence, and maintain a maritime presence off the Haitian coast in the coming weeks. France, with regional overseas territories like French Guiana, Martinique, and Guadeloupe, is looking to develop greater political and business ties with Guyana. Last year, Charles de Affaires Jose Gomez recommitted to establishing a full-fledged diplomatic presence, and work is ongoing in that regard. It's really impressive with uh, Guyana because uh, Guyana has the, um, has the best uh, world uh, growth of the last three years, and uh, for us, it's a uh, it's a very uh, it's a country where we want to focus on. That's why we open uh, a representation here to uh, to help our French company to come uh, more and uh, discover uh, the the Guyan Guyanese. Potential. Let's talk now about the interests of French companies coming into Guyana. Are they only looking to participate in oil and gas? Are they looking at other sectors? What's the interest really? No, well, first of all, the ones who are here are mainly focused on oil and gas, but mm -hmm. not, not only, as I mentioned, our, let's say, all this uh, French company, uh, Amazon Caribbean, is on a um, so called palm tree plantation right. in uh, Region 1. Uh, it's um, I think the company has been uh, uh, has been created about uh, 20 years ago. So and it's, and it's working very interestingly to um, to export some palm trees to, towards uh, European markets, and it's a good uh, good point. We have some uh, some company in uh, in uh, let's say in oil and gas business like Technip FMC, like Bourbon, 
which I use. It's better for uh, for X and uh, uh, FPSO. So we are, we have a lot of uh, let's say uh, company focused on the oil and gas, but now we want to go further mm -hmm. because as we know, well, there will be also a very interesting uh, development of infrastructure. And as you know, France has a lot of, to offer on that on that kind. Uh, either on energy transition, on en energy production, and uh, also on, uh, on other topics. I will come back uh, again with a, a new uh, French delegation of companies, I think uh, in mid-May or mid-June, and I would like to, uh, to have a lot of, uh, of uh, company uh, and a business-to-business -business meeting with uh, Guyanese uh, companies. In international news, war and conflict in some African countries have displaced millions of people. Many have fled to refugee camps in neighboring Chad, but they're finding little work and inadequate infrastructure to sustain them, Al Jazeera reports. As if its own internal conflict and poverty weren't enough, Chad has for some years become a place of refuge to many fleeing wars in neighboring countries. Tribal clashes in Cameroon drove Fatima Hassan to this refugee camp in western Chad. We can't go back to our village. We have seen many corpses there. Some of the people were killed in front of our eyes. We can't go back. She isn't alone. There are about 100,000 Cameroonian refugees in Chad. Nearly 10,000 of them are here in the Kalabari camp. But Chad hosts dozens of similar camps with refugees from the Central African Republic, Darfur, Nigeria and elsewhere. And this is a part of a wider phenomenon across Central and Eastern Africa. Ongoing conflicts have created millions of refugees and displaced people in Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, Eritrea, Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Last year, United Nations estimated the number of refugees and forcibly displaced persons in Africa had reached 36 million. The reason behind these refugees and displaced people is well known, and it is mainly the lack of peace and coexistence. For Africa to go forward and to achieve progress, we must establish peace. Here at the Kalabari, aid agencies are trying to help in different ways, including small agricultural projects where refugees can grow their own food. The camps provide temporary shelter, but they're struggling when it comes to other basic requirements. The refugees know they don't have a long-term future in Chad. For now, they say they feel thankful for the safety they're enjoying and can only hope for peace to prevail in their countries so they can return home. Mohamed Fahd, Al Jazeera. In sports, former Jamaican basketballer Simon Edwards, who became the first Jamaican player to compete in the WNBA in the United States, has passed away. Edwards died on Thursday after a lengthy battle with ovarian cancer. She was 49 years old. Edwards made her mark in junior college at Oklahoma, becoming a first All-American in that school's history before moving to the University of Iowa, where she led them in a field goal percentage during the 1996-1997 season. In 1997, Edwards was picked as a developmental player for New York Liberty in the WNBA for three years, but failed to play in any match until she joined the expansion franchise Seattle Storm in the year 2000. And that's the news on PBC Jamaica. I am Simone Absalom Gale. You can follow us on our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. Thank you so much for watching.